talk about the U.S. Japan relations in the post-war Japanese history. And uh, I'm a historian, so I usually teach international history in a Japanese university. But at the same time, I uh, I'm affiliated to actually six single tanks in Tokyo. So so usually I also uh, discuss and research on the recent international relations in Asia. U.S. Japan alliance and so on. So let me start my talk with an uh, anecdote. Uh, soon after the end of the Cold War, some diplomats coming from an East European country asked in the United States how to be a very close ally to the United States. And one American man answered in this way: Well, there are only two countries in history who actually attacked a soul, the UK and Japan. And after the wars, the United States and the UK and the United States and Japan became really close allies and friends. Of course, there can be several answers and uh, reasons why we can say so, but uh, maybe uh, after the war, they fully understood the importance of the friendship and uh, partnership between the two sides Rather than fighting each other, it's much better to be friendly uh, for, for, for their national interests. So after the Second World War, particularly in Japan, people uh, actually began to rethink about the future. It's really nicer to be a friend of the United States. But there are some other reasons why Japan became really very close uh, to the United States or becomes. Because uh, after the war, even though uh, we uh, fought fiercely each other, but the uh, United States, American people in Japan, in uh, occupied Japan, showed, presented um, um, a really exceptional, unprecedented friendship to Japanese people. Rather than killing Japanese people, they provided chocolates and other things as well to kids in Japan. That's why. They directly so because before 1945, people in Japan couldn't have much opportunity to meet directly American people. So American people before the 1945 Japanese minors were rather abstract, abstract and quite um, uh, uh, just an idea. But after 1945, many Japanese people could see American people in Japanese soul. And they saw quite friendly American people. And we saw Russians in Manchuria and also in uh, other areas and northern territories as well. And they saw different kind of people there because uh, even after the end of the war, I mean, Japanese government, emperor, ordered to stop fighting after August 18th. So that's, that's why Japanese army people stopped fighting. But uh, in some areas, like in Manchuria, north, north, northeast part of China, actually Russians and Soviets invaded there, and uh, they continued the fighting. Oh yes, thank you very much. And so that's why uh, Japanese experience after 1945, I would say, uh, set the course of post-war Japanese foreign policy based upon their experiences. The experience in Japan, uh, occupied Japan, made the, the mindset of Japanese people in a much more friendly manner toward the Americans or the United States. But on the other hand, we experienced quite differently in northeastern parts of China uh, by having experienced the Russian invasion there. As we saw in Ukraine, so you can easily imagine how it was. Particularly Japanese people strongly support Ukraine because we saw what we experienced in after 1945 in those areas. We saw, we experienced Russian invasion. That's why we easily could, we can imagine how Ukrainians are now experienced there. So in a sense, I would say that the US-Japan relations uh, uh, Begun to pave a quite different way after 1945, even though we experienced fractations, many ways, frictions, uh, confrontations, and of course, many, many disagreements. But anyway, I'd like to start by saying in my introduction on three points. 
After the Second World War, Japan had reshaped its own national identity as a leading defender of the liberal and international order in the Asia Pacific. Of course, Japanese uh, people, Japan, invaded Asia countries before 1945 and killed many Asians. And actually, one of the biggest points was that Japan destroyed and damaged international order, regional order there. So, after the end of the war, Japanese political leaders decided to think that Japan should reshape its own national identity. And that national identity has remained, I, I would say, until today. This is one thing that I want to focus on. The second thing is, uh, with the signing of the US-Japan Security Treaty, Japan has become a leading ally to the United States during the Cold War years and beyond. So that friendship was based on and largely defined by the direction of the Cold War. Cold for Cold War confrontation actually made, uh, uh, that raised the Japanese value as a strategic ally much higher than the Americans, or Americans originally thought. So the Cold War actually cemented and enhanced the US-Japan Friendship Alliance. This is the second point. And so it was natural, nat natural I would say, that after the end of the Cold War, many people began to wonder whether that Cold War alliance could continue, whether the friendship after the end of the Cold War could continue. It was natural to ask that. But after the end of the Cold War, we know that the relationship and the partnership has further developed and enhanced. Maybe there must be some reason for this, and I will talk about this later. And thirdly, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has transformed Japan as a productive, proactive contributor to peace. He believed that Japan could remain a major player of the international politics of the 21st century. I know that uh, Shinzo Abe was really a controversial figure as a political leader. One of the reasons why he was con uh, uh, quite uh, controversial is and was and is that he wanted to transport Japan in a new shape, and some people doubted that intention, and some people welcomed that intention. One of the reasons why he wanted to change Japanese national identity was, uh, from my point of view, because he thought that Japan should not just be uh, a, 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 a recipient of, uh, just a, a free rider of the international community just benefiting from American goodwill. Because of the American goodwill, or Japanese uh, foreign policy had been uh, uh, quite uh, cheap. And uh, uh, Japanese foreign policy based upon the Yoshida doctrine which I will talk a bit later, uh, was based on the strong US Japan alliance. Because of that, Prime Minister Yoshida thought that Japan couldn't spend much for our national defense. So we could rely on the will of the American people. And that would uh, satisfy Asians because Japan's defense budget could remain quite low. And the Japanese uh, defense posture could uh, remain quite low profile. So it's a kind of an answer to the post-war Japanese national identity to be very close to the United States, and also uh, to be weak in Asia. But the Asia today is different. China is really powerful. Uh, in the last uh, 25 years, the Chinese defense budget became, uh, becomes uh, 40 times bigger than before. And uh, around the end of the Cold War, Japanese US budget was nearly 10 times bigger than Chinese defense budget. But nowadays, Chinese defense budget is five times bigger than Japanese defense budget. So even though many Japanese people 
you want to maintain Japanese defense profile right in a in a low way, quite in a, a low, but uh, at the same time, this government has been repeatedly saying to Japanese government to spend more to help uh, themselves. So this is a big dilemma because if Japan raises the defense budget, Japanese people must worry about the feeling of some countries like Koreans and Chinese. That's why Antil Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister and Prime Ministers, didn't respond to American requests pos positively. But Abe changed out. Abe introduced his new foreign policy doctrine by we usually call it the Abe Doctrine, which focuses on the importance of value for Japanese alliance relationship with the United States. Uh, should not only be based on the rational calculation or necessity, but a US Japan alliance must be based on the sharing of common values like democracy, freedom, rule of law, and so on. Beforehand, many Japanese prime ministers didn't think in this way. Rather than that, Yoshida Shigeru was extremely pragmatic. So uh, he thought that. Uh, uh, he once said in the national diet, the Americans are just no children. So we, we can pay for it, and they can protect us. But that's all. So Yoshida Shigeru was quite problematic and rational. That's why he thought it not wiser to pass the Americans to defend us. It's the best formula for us, for the Asians and Americans, because we were quite poor. But uh, recently, we are not so. And we need to pay more to satisfy American voters because just defending the Japanese people uh, by American budgets can continue. So can, can, can be continued. So that's why I think to continue the US Japan alliance, as it felt it necessary to change Japanese national identity to become a pro proactive contributor to peace. But this is one reason why he is very much welcomed. And uh, his foreign policy was well received by many people in the world. So, the transformations of Abe's security policy must be, had to be coincided with a new way of thinking about historical reconciliation between the two sides. That's why I think you remember what he said in the joint session of the American Congress, in which he's apologized to the Americans and the Asians. But we did. In the war year. So, without that, without presenting sincere, honest feeling about what he thought about the war, Japan actually couldn't transform its foreign policy, security policy. That's why the two things had to be stamped together. I mean, the historical understanding and the transformation of security policy. Otherwise, Japan cannot be trusted. And I joined in the post process historical statement and also the creation of a historical statement, other statement, and also the transformation of security policy reform. And I felt that these things uh, have to be interrelated. And that's why I was often uh, heavily criticized by some Japanese right wing. I changed a bit others' historical understanding. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, maybe he kindly read some of my books and articles, and he actually deepened his understanding about Japanese history. And I'm glad that uh, he was seriously studying about it by reading many books, including mine, to understand what we did before I could revise. In fact, we should do academic reform. So, well, these are the three things, uh, main points that I like to talk today. Actually, this book, I contributed a chapter, actually, with my mentor, a super former supervisor, and uh, Shinji Kitamuka. Uh, uh, we wrote in, uh, in this chapter that, quote, in September 1951, Japan's Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida signed the US Japan Security Treaty. That turned Japan from a former enemy to an indispensable ally of the United States during the Cold War years. Unquote. So I said already about this. 
And uh, this is important because this was critical turning point for Japanese history, modern Japanese history. After this, Japan actually has set the course to become a really close ally to the United States. Uh, to do that, of course, we nearly uh, needed to present Japan as a democratic society, open society. We need to present a new national identity to be trusted by the Americans or to much wider international community. So in a sense, uh, Japan needed to create a new national identity to become a truly trustful ally to the United States. Also, uh, in a uh, 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 in the preface of uh, perhaps the most the best book on the history of the New Japan relations, uh, Professor Makoto Iokibe, a leading uh, historian of uh, Japanese political history, he wrote in his preface that quote Japan was determined and fully committed to embark on the possible path to a peaceful return to international society while the United States, which in the meantime had become the most influential nation in the world, as well as the leader of the West, and the history supported the Japan's democratization process, along with the quest of economic recovery. People often said that the US Japan alliance is a, a, a singularly the most important bilateral relations. Of course, many people now usually tend to think that U.S.-Japan and U.S.-China relations is the most important one. I agree with this, basically. But the reason why many people, uh, like, uh, uh, well, many, many people in the United States mention on the importance of the U.S.-Japan relationship, or because this is an alliance relationship by two different civilizations, two different cultures. So uh, racially, ethnically, Culturally, civilizationally, Japan and the United States actually came from a different point. But at the same time, the two countries create the most, uh, 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 that's the strongest and the most trustful alliance relationship in a current international society. Both sides basically trust each other, and both sides actually need. Is understand the alliance relationship between the two countries. According to many, many op public opinion poll, this is really rare, like a UK-US alliance relationship. Well, actually, UK-US relationship is an alliance between two, of course, distinctive different countries, but the two rather civilizationally a similar Western past, which share the common language and which share a large part a Christianity or a kind of a religious belief into, uh, of course, limited sense, uh, extent. But at the same time, uh, we need to understand the difference between the UK-Japan, uh, UK-US alliance and UK-US-Japan alliance because US-Japan alliance was much more diff diff difficult to create. So we need to continue to make a great effort to maintain that alliance relationship. But that's why, as I said, many people in the United States said that this is singularly the most important bilateral relationship. Because this is not quite natural. This was artificial, but this become much more natural than before because of the efforts that two sides have presented and created. And also, I also like to uh, uh, focus on the importance of this. This is a report of the advisory panel of the history of the 20th century and on Japan's role in the world order in the 21st century. And as I said, uh, uh, well, I partly joined in creating Abe's statement, or, or the basic understand, historical understanding of the uh, best statement, and uh, th this was uh, Shinji Kitaoka, my former mentor, and uh, he actually uh, 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 organized the advisory panel to present the report to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. So based upon this report, I would say that the Shinzo Abe created the Abe's statement, and in which 
it was written, I quote, however, in the second half of the 20th century, based on deep remorse over the war, Japan has been reborn as a country that is completely different from what it was in the first half of the 20th century, particularly in the period between the 1930s and the first half of the 1940s. Peace, rule of law, liberal democracy, respect for human rights, the free trade system, self-determination, support for the economic development of developing countries, etc., are what characterize post-war Japan. So Japan was reborn after 1945, and he focused on the importance of that change. Many people already uh, beforehand doubted the aim and intention of Shinzo Abe to issue his talker statement because many uh, uh, thought that he tried to transform Japan to a kind of uh, pre-war shape. Uh, pre-war, he, many people uh, uh, thought that Shinzo Abe wanted to restore uh, the pre-war Japanese national identity to, to, to only damage a post-war Japanese democracy. But he clearly stated in, on the importance of democracy and rule of law and so on, uh, and also, he also focused on the importance of changes of 1945. So that's why, after having read many books as well as uh, learning by himself, I would say that he uh, created a very good uh, historical statement, which is largely uh, 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 well perceived by the Americans and Asian as well, many people in the Asian countries as well. So then I like to also mention on the importance of Japanese effort to defend liberal international order. As I said, uh, historical understanding deeply relates to the possible Japanese foreign policy because we, I mean, the Japan damaged international order in the 1930s and 1940s. We needed to create a new national identity and a new national identity means that Japan should be a defender of liberal international order, or the rule-based international order. Without this kind of a stable international order, we cannot prosper, and we cannot maintain stability, peace and stability. That's why, rather than the destroyer of the international order, we should become a defender of liberal international order. This is a new national identity. And this was what Prime Minister Yoshida Shigeru created that this was a transformation of Japan after the war. After the end of the Second World War, Japan has become a leading defender of the liberal international order in the Asia Pacific. Number one, I like to focus on the importance of the fact that with its peace constitution of 1947, Japan has become the country which is, so to speak, the most faithful, I would say, to the norm of the prohibition of the use of military force of course, this is written in the Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution as a means to settle international disputes. And this identity is not really widely shared uh, today by leading powers such as Russia, with some other countries as well. And this is written in the newest American National Security Strategy, which was published a few days before. So uh, we can see that this norm is now in danger because people now don't think peace is important, as we saw in Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And number two, I also like to focus on the importance of the fact that post-war Japan believes that Japan can prosper through international trade and integration with the global economy. So now Japan is often seen as a leading defender of free trade. A few years before Japan created EU-Japan Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, or Free Trade Area. And this is generally regarded as the largest free trade area nowadays in, in the world. And also, at the same time, Japan created, or initiated to create, a, a, a CPTPP, a Trans-Pacific Trans Trans Partnership Agreement. Uh, without the United States, because both President Obama and President Trump, even President Biden, refused to join the trade framework. 
But this is the singularly the most important trade free trade area in the in the Pacific region. And Japan has been in a driving sea to create and expand that free trade area. So generally speaking, I would say that Japan has been in a leading position to defend trade free trade free trade area. Uh, interestingly, some countries like the UK and the United States, uh, some people are talking about walls to create walls, walls uh, to defend uh, from uh, immigrations or uh, foreigners who try to invade in these countries. Of course, I would say at the same time that United States and the United Kingdom are two most liberal free trade countries perhaps in the world, but maybe because of largely due to this fact. Some people are really frustrated and angry about this policy of tradition. So in a sense, it would be difficult for uh, political leaders in the UK and the US to uh, loudly say that we are the defender and uh, leader uh, to expand the free trade. So in a sense, Japan has been playing, playing an important role as a leading player to defend free trade. Thirdly, I also like to say that Prime Ministers of Japan have more power under the parliamentary cabinet system or democratic system, political institution, unlike the weak power of the cabinet under the major constitution before the war. And the post-war constitution guarantees freedom of speech. Before 1945, Japanese political system was largely defined by major constitution. And the major constitution actually was drafted and created based on German imperial political system. Uh, there was a debate in Meiji area when the political leaders uh, tried to create a new constitution. And uh, some uh, 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 political leaders uh, argue that the parents should introduce British or American uh, democratic system. But others argue that because of the Japan is a late comer. So for us, uh, American or British political system was so advanced, it was difficult for us to introduce it. That's why Japanese political leaders at that time preferred German imperial system. That's why our political system was quite different from American or British political system. Much less democratic, much less rules based so in the sense, after 1945, we needed to create a new constitution which presented a, quite, a, a, a different vision of political rule. So this was a new course after 1945. And then I mentioned a few times about uh, Yoshida doctrine, and I talked a little about this. A possible Japan strategy called the Yoshida doctrine, named after the prime minister of the early uh, possible years, Shigeru Yoshida, oriented towards the alliance relationship with the United States, and it reduced Japan defense spending. So it was a cheap ride, and uh, this foreign policy doctrine was preferred by the majority of Japanese people because Japan was a poor country. Japan, Japanese people, uh, Japan uh, uh, couldn't afford uh, the government to spend more for defense. So repeatedly, the American government had been frustrated at the fact that the United States government needed to spend a huge amount of money to defend Japan. And uh, this had been a kind of a political or diplomatic source of friction between the two sides. So uh, Shinzo Abe uh, felt it necessary to change the previous Yoshida doctrine's course to spend more for defense. And while Japan has been defended by American military forces, Japan could concentrate on economic reconstruction. This arguably became the basis of post-war Japan's economic miracle. Secondly, I will talk about Japan's post-war Japan relationship in, at, with East Asian countries. Well, Japan has been a provi provider of peace and prosperity, and I will talk about why this was so and this is so. Since Japan had become the second largest economy in 1969, 
Japan began to, to increase its ODA towards developing countries. Of course, there are some secrets for this. First of all, uh, United, because largely because of the Cold War, United States government allowed Japan to have a soft peace. It means that at the San Francisco Peace Conference in September 1951, the United States government didn't ask Japan to provide a huge amount of uh, 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 money uh, and, uh, uh, for reparation. Uh, and uh, this uh, could become a foundation of post-war Japanese economic growth. So without uh, spending a huge amount of money, unlike a post-war Germany after the First World War, uh, this general peace, this quite soft peace, made the Japan to continue its economic growth. But uh, because of this, Japanese government began to think that Japan uh, should do something to help surrounding Asia countries because Japan didn't have to pay for those reparations. And one of the re one, one of the answer to this difficult question was to provide ODA to surrounding Asia countries to help this country to be more prosperous and more peaceful. So this is a new course of Asian East Asian history after the Second World War. So Japan's political leaders thought that economic prosperity would become the basis of peace and the stability, and then economic cooperation and assistances, rather than military engagement, that should be the foundation of Japanese foreign policy to East Asia. Then, the British Foreign Secretary visited in the late 1960s. He asked Japanese Prime Minister on the necessity of sending troops to Vietnam, because at the time, American government fiercely, strongly pressured both Japanese and British government to send troops to Vietnam. And British government wondered whether the UK really needed to send troops to Vietnam. That's why he, Foreign Secretary of the UK, asked Japanese government, Japanese Prime Minister, on the necessity further, Japanese government was wondering thinking about sending troops to Vietnam. The answer of Japanese Prime Minister was like this. The essence of peace in Vietnam should be based on economic development, not military invasion. That's why sending troops wouldn't help the Vietnamese to help and to have peace there. So the first priority must be to make them more prosperous, richer, then they can have peace. So what Japan should do is not to send troops to Vietnam. Rather than that, what Japan would do is to provide ODA to the Vietnamese people. This is what Japanese government did. Japanese government didn't send troops to Vietnam. Around that time, many people in Japan thought that it was necessary to send troops to Vietnam to save, to defend the Japan alliance. But Japanese government didn't do this because of this philosophy. This was based on philosophy like this. And, uh, well, uh, reading the British archive, archive resources, I found that that British Foreign Secretary wrote to Foreign Office in London that Japan has a great Prime Minister. And actually Britain followed the same course, not to send troops to the Vietnam. I don't know if the British government really uh, 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 seriously thought about sending troops to the Vietnam, but well, maybe he was relieved by hearing that Japan has no intention to send troops to the Vietnam. So in that sense, the United States government was really angry about this, but I think it was true to say this. Prosperity should be the basis and the foundation of uh, peace in Asia. That's why making them richer or uh, helping them to become richer is the first priority of Japanese Asian policy. But that's why many people doubted the intention of Japanese ODA because many people thought that Japanese ODA was to just to 
make Japan further richer by exploiting Asian people. I think part of it is true, but it's a win-win. To make Japan richer, to make Asians richer, then Japan can, Japan and Asia can become more peaceful. This is a formula. So this is only partly true to say that Japan is doing, Japan was doing, uh, providing only, only for the purpose of making Japan richer. This is just partially true. But the other side of the truth is that Japan wanted to make Asia more peaceful. Because more in Asia, the, the, the seriously damaged Japanese economic growth. That's why Japan preferred peace in Asia. And I think that this policy remains the same. On the other hand, Chinese foreign policy is much more, much, was much more driven by its history. Of course, China was invaded by certain parts. That's why revitalization, restoration of national pride is what well, must be first priority for China. The Japanese priority is different because because of that national pride, Japan was defeated in ruin. Rather than restoring national pride, the well, Japanese government after 1945 uh, thought of that by reshaping its national history, Japan should be a defender of liberal international order. And also, Japan should be provider of peace and prosperity in the region. I think Japan shows very good records of doing this. So that's why I think this kind of a strategy was important. And then, Japanese ODA is based on a philosophy which is quite different from Western ODA. One of the most important points for Japanese ODA policy or the philosophy of this is ownership and partnership. The future development of the country must be owned by those people, Asians, Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese. They own the future. We cannot teach. We try to teach them before 1945 as a leader in East Asia. Japan tried to create great East Asian cause prosperity for fear that we failed. We shouldn't be a leader. They should be leaders. I mean, Asian people must be leaders in each country. We are not teachers. We are not leaders. We are just uh, trying to be silent with them because they own their future. And we can be partner nevertheless. We can be partner to these Asian peoples. But we need to tell them they are owner of their own country. That's why if they become poorer, that their fault, because they own their future. And if they aspire to be richer, maybe they can become so. And we will help them. But uh, at the same time, they should own their future. So this is an important philosophy, I would say, of Japanese ODA policy. So my mentor, Shinichi Kitaoka, becomes and became the head of the Japan ODA agency, Japan International Cooperation Agency. And he truly practiced as the head of the JICA, this philosophy. He wrote uh, in, 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 in his speech that if we force our support upon developing countries by ignoring their culture and tradition, the support will not be able to last for long. Japan pushed forward with modernization, focusing our efforts on such cornerstones of national development as education, public health, and infrastructure, while at the same time maintaining our treasured culture and tradition. So we are enriching their history and tradition, and we are respecting their historical uh, uh, path while providing and helping them to have better education, better public health, better infrastructure. This is what we did, because this is what we did in Meiji era. Our spending for education was the largest in share of government spending in major era in the world. So spending for education made us richer. So this is what we try to tell, tell to Asian countries. 
they did it. And the richer than Japan in many ways. Because Japan should spend more for education. But unlike many other countries, like uh, US, UK, France, they're providing weapons in their OTA. Of course, not all, but uh, large, uh, 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 a certain share of the uh, aids, actually, uh, related to those military equipment. But Japan uh, has not been sending or providing those military equipment because of these Japanese tradition and also because of some of the regulations. So, Japanese OTA is mainly, mainly, mainly for enriching education, public health, and infrastructure. And then I'd like to talk a bit about a bit of So Even though I don't have time, I just uh, put a few words on this and I will end this. And Abe focused on the importance of defending values. Previously, a rational economic calculation uh, actually defined the Japanese foreign policy. But uh, rational economic calculation should be not all of part of Japanese foreign policy shouldn't occupy everything in Japanese foreign policy because uh, economic calculation is one thing, but there are other things. And defending values would be other important point. And Abe included this in Japanese foreign policy. But before that, it was difficult for Japanese government to say this because of the pre-war experience in Japan. Japan was trying to install Japanese ideas and values in Asian countries. That's why, after 1945, we had refrained ourselves from installing or providing those values to Asian people. But Abe thought that by facing history squarely, maybe we can start or restart new foreign policy. And this was the origin of Abe's foreign policy. And based upon this understanding, Abe actually reshaped Japanese foreign policy by enriching and enhancing Japan's cooperation with like-minded liberal democracies. Before that, China was, China is Japan's uh, largest trading partner. If we, our foreign policy should be based on our economic calculation, China should be the most important country to Japan. But if ideas, values are important, of course, China shouldn't be the most important country to Japan. The most important country in Japan should be the United States because the United States has been a major defender or leader of defending liberal values, human rights, democracy, freedom, rule of law, and so on. In the last, in the last one or two centuries, the United States has been the leader of defending these values. If Japan Japanese foreign policy should be based on defending values, of course. The most important Japanese partner should be the United States, with some other democratic countries, such as Australia, India, and so on. And by connecting these four most important democracies in the region, Japan, United States, Australia, and India, Abe invented a new concept of Quad. The Quad is Abe's creation. Abe thought it important because liberal democracy matters. On the other hand, previous Japanese foreign policy was focusing on the importance of Japanese trade relationships. That's why Japan was focusing on our relationship with China and Southeast Asia by creating the Asia bloc or Asia economic supply chain. But even though it is still important, but values matter. That's why Abe reshaped its foreign policy. And then he created a new regional concept of Indo-Pacific, and also he created a new concept of uh, diplomatic doctrine called Free and Open Indo-Pacific. And then uh, I'd like to end my talk by saying that uh, US relationships still matter because values are important. And uh, we need to reshape regional order by focus on the importance of cooperation among liberal democracies, because we are facing the rise of authoritarian regimes, and authoritarian regimes will, in future, be able to become a majority in international community. And uh, Freedom House is saying that in the last 16 years, we are seeing the retreat of 
liberal democratic values or liberal democracy. So in future, we will see that we will become a minority. But one of the important things is that Japan is not a Western country. We are not a Christian country. But still, we are defending these liberal values. So we can send that these liberal values is not, are not based on Christianity or Western civilization. But this is a universal value because Japan can prosper and Japan can be richer by defending these values. Before 1945, we are poorer and we are less secure. But with these liberal values, we can become richer and more prosperous. That's why we naturally tend to think from our heart that liberal values matter. Because we are happier than before, before 1945, with these values. That's why we are defending these values. And these are our values, not American or Western values, but our values. And we are happier with these values. That's why we like to say that these values matter. And these values must be the foundation of regional order in the, in the Pacific. And this is what the administration did, and this is what Kishida, current Kishida administration is doing. That's why we are, unlike many other Asian countries, we are imposing sanctions upon Russia because we have peace constitution. We think that liberal order matter, liberal international order matter. That's why if Russia is try, trying to destroy, damage liberal international order, we are against it because we did it in 1970s and 40s. We did damage and destroy international order and we thought we are wrong. That's why after 1945, as I said, we reshaped our national identity. And I hope that Russian people soon realize that they can learn something from Japanese experience. And they will learn that it's much better for them to be prosperous, but prospering, to be uh, more uh, secure. To, uh, it's much better for them to defend rather than destroy liberal international values. So that's what I really like to talk today. Thank you very much indeed.